four days, nine safety experts, 13 presentations, one simple mission, to make diving safer. This is Dan at DEMA 2020. Safety seminars from the pros who know. Good afternoon and welcome everybody to day one of Dan's DEMA webinars. We are thrilled to be participating in DEMA 2020. It's a bit of a different format, but um, it's, it's really good to be with you all. So thank you for joining us. Uh, special thanks to all Dan members who are with us today. It is because of your support that we are able to do everything we do. So thank you for that. Um, I wanna get a quick piece of housekeeping business out of the way. Uh, we will be taking uh, questions during this presentation. Uh, we'll have a short Q&A session uh, with the presenter at the end. Um, and uh, if you will pitch those questions to me, my name is Brian Harper. I'm the Director of Communications here at Dan. So please uh, send me your questions uh, during the presentation and I will uh, share them with the presenter um, she'll be able to answer them. Um, you can also put, put them in the chat to everyone. Just make sure you don't send them to the Divers Alert Network account as that one is not monitored. Uh, so with that out of the way, I would like to introduce our speaker. Um, welcome to Chloe Strauss. Chloe is the Risk Mitigation Coordinator here at DAN. She's a dive instructor. She's taught both recreational and scientific diving. Uh, she has worked as a molecular biology researcher and she is currently studying for her master's in public health. Uh, so Chloe, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so today we're going to be talking about disinfection and infection control in the dive business. Um, obviously, this has been something that's really been on everybody's minds during the COVID-19 pandemic. This will not be specific to COVID, but there are some things that we know from COVID or have been doing during COVID that will be applicable during this presentation. So without further ado, let's get started. First things first is what are disinfection and infection control? And the different, the knowing the terminology here is actually gonna be pretty important. So disinfection is the act of removing all germs from a hard surface. And this is different than sanitization, which is lowering germs to a safe level, which would be determined by your local public health standards. Knowing the difference between these two will not only help you use the correct terminology in conversation or in any materials that you may put out or in your disinfection and infection control policies, but a disinfectant and a sanitizer product are actually different. The goals are different and they are going to be killing different microorganisms. So if you need a, a, a solution that's going to disinfect, kill a certain microorganism, but you buy a sanitizer, you may think that you are, you know, doing one thing, but you're actually not, you're not reaching that goal. So knowing the difference is going to be very, very important. And infection control is preventing or stopping the spread of infection. And we all know a little bit about how to do that because of COVID, washing your hands, having good respiratory hygiene, disinfecting high touch surfaces, and social distancing. Why is this important? Well, it's important for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's going to prevent the spread of disease among your staff, customers, and clients, or to the public. Additionally, customers want to know that you are taking care of them and that you care about their health and safety. Having these infection control and disinfection policies and procedures in place is going to keep them coming back. It's going to have them telling their friends about your operation, and it's going to cause them to give you good reviews. Another thing that's really important is that you need to make sure that these policies are being enforced and, and acted upon, and customers are going to see that and feel safer. This brings us to how do, disease, how do diseases spread? 
There are a few ways. Contact via touch is the first. So if you touch a contaminated or high touch surface, and then you touch one of your mucous membranes, such as your eyes, nose, or mouth, which are kind of made to absorb things, you could get sick that way. Another way is droplets. And there are kind of two forms of droplets. Um, first are larger droplets, which are expelled from a cough or sneeze. The second kind of droplets are aerosolized. It doesn't have to be a droplet, but some droplets can be aerosolized. Um, and these can survive in air currents and carry infection that way. Um, a really good example of this is tuberculosis, can survive in air currents and, um, and can be an aerosolized particle. Another way aerosolized particles can infect are through dust, such as mold. The next way is through a skin puncture. And this is when pathogens enter your system through broken skin. So as scuba divers, we all know to be careful of sharp rocks or to watch where we put our hands when we're underwater because there are some animals that can have spines and puncture our skin and cause us to get an infection that way. It's also very important to note that bodies of water can carry pathogens that are not found on land. And this can include um, harmful algae, parasites, other toxins, heavy metals, and stuff like that. This brings us to what to disinfect. This is gonna be really important because our scuba equipment touches some of these really important mucous membranes, such as our eyes and face, eyes, nose, and mouth. Um, so equipment that, that's gonna be really relevant here is your mask, snorkel, regulator, and don't forget your BCD oral, inf oral inflator if you're orally inflating. Now, every time we dive, we don't orally inflate, but if you're training, this may be an important aspect to make sure you're paying attention to. Anything that's shared between divers should be disinfected. So this is gonna be really important for rental equipment. Um, another thing that is really important to think about is if you are an instructor and you are doing alternate air source skills with your students and you are donating your octo to them, since it's your personal equipment, you might not think about disinfecting that, but that octo has changed hands. It's gone in between divers. So it's very important to make sure you're paying attention to that as well and disinfecting it after use. Another place is high touch surfaces. So if you have a lot of people who are um, filling, filling cylinders, so these cylinders are gonna be touched by many hands and the fill station is gonna be touched by many hands such as the fill whips or the controls on the fill station, this is gonna be really important to disinfect because we know you get out of the water, you're wet, you're wiping off your eyes, your nose, your mouth, and then you're touching cylinders and the fill whips and everything, um, that can spread germs really quickly. Another important uh, area is the retail space. So if customers are coming, they're touching bathrooms, they're touching counters, credit card machines. These are all gonna be relatively high touch spaces. Next thing we'll talk about is how to disinfect. So the most important thing is that a disinfectant solution should contact all surfaces that you wish to disinfect. So, when we think about certain types of disinfectants or ways of disinfecting, you might think of sprays, wipes, and then concentrated solutions that you can make a liquid out of. Wipes might not be adequate for scuba equipment, regulators specifically, because for a disinfectant wipe or any disinfectant solution to work, it has to contact all of the surfaces that you want to disinfect. And for those of you who have taken apart or seen the inside of a regulator, you know that there are all of these nooks and crannies. So when I have the regulator inside my mouth and I bite down on that mouthpiece and exhale into the regulator, my exhaled breath and all of those droplets that I'm exhaling are going to go to all of these little places inside the regulator. So therefore, just wiping the mouthpiece off with a, with a disinfectant wipe probably isn't going to be sufficient. For this reason, spraying or using a solution that you immerse a regulator in is probably going to be better. Now, for a mask, a disinfectant wipe might be just fine. The second really important thing is to choose a product that is safe to use on scuba equipment. Not all disinfectants can be used on scuba equipment. Since it is a breathing apparatus, what's going to happen is that product manufacturers will do further testing. And this further testing will determine if the product is safe for these breathing apparatuses for this use. Another incredibly important ones, all of these are really important, but this one also is follow the directions. More solution or soaking it for longer is not always better. Um, for example, if you're using a bleach solution, 
and you add a certain amount of bleach and you say, oh, well, if a third of a cup is, is of bleach is good, maybe a cup is better. Or if soaking my gear for a minute is good, two minutes is better. This isn't the case. Manufacturers have come up with their directions and they've tested these products and they've tested the times and they know that say a minute is gonna be plenty. So make sure you're following the directions. This also includes the use of PPE. If the directions for a product say that gloves and eye protection are required, you need to make sure that you are using or providing gloves and eye protection for the people who will be doing the disinfecting and using this product. Always remember that if you're, use, if you're disinfecting scuba equipment, rinse it thoroughly in fresh water and allow it to dry completely before use. This is usually part of the directions for the, the product. So again, make sure you're reading that label. And what it's gonna ha what's gonna happen is it's gonna allow any remaining chemicals that are on your, on your equipment to kind of break down and go away as the equipment or the product dries. A really important note here is personal equipment. So if I am just going on a dive vacation and I'm going to a resort and I bring all of my own equipment, it might just be easier for me to rinse all of my equipment back at my room. Or if I'm diving near home, just bring it all home and rinse it. That way we're really not relying on anybody else to make sure our equipment's clean. And we're not putting our stuff in these communal rinse tanks, risking the possibility of infection. Choosing a disinfectant. So the EPA has multiple lists, lists A through O. And these lists are products that are um, made specifically to kill a pathogen, or not made to specifically kill a pathogen, but they, they can kill specific pathogens. So if you have something in mind, say there's a disease in your area that you wanna make sure you're protecting your, your staff and your clients from, you can choose a product on one of these lists. We're all familiar with list N, which is the list of EPA approved products that will definitely work against the coronavirus. Um, but there are far more pathogens such as HIV, hepatitis. Um, there's a list for norovirus, which is a good one, which is a stomach bug that, that, that goes around sometime. So if you have something in mind, this is a really good resource for, resource for you. If not, you can just see what's available in your area and look at the label and find the EPA registration number for the product. This is usually gonna be on the back of the label somewhere, or you can Google it and find the products SDS and the EPA registration number will be on that as well. You'll enter its registration number into the EPA's pesticide product and label system. If you Google EPA pesticide product and label system, a link to this website will come up. And at the very top, there's a, a place for you to enter the EPA registration number, which will then take you to the EPA registration document for the product. Here you can find all sorts of language for surfaces and areas and places where this product has been approved for use. So what I have here is a screenshot of a sample registration document from a product that can be used on scuba equipment. Now it's gonna be relatively rare to see scuba equipment specifically mentioned on an EPA registration document. We've only seen two products out of, I don't know, maybe hundreds that actually have scuba listed. So what we wanna look for instead is language that indicates a product can be used on respirators or breathing apparatuses or gas masks. So for example, the product that I have the, the picture of in the presentation says that it can be used to clean and disinfect firefighting air masks, half mask respirators, full face breathing apparatuses, gas masks. So this is the type of language that we're looking for. If a disinfectant that's on the EPA's list N or that's registered with the EPA cannot be found, you can use bleach. The CDC recommends um, a third of a cup of bleach per gallon of water with a soaking time of one minute. This is a relatively weak solution. And remember, the CDC specifies household bleach. We're not talking about super concentrated bleach or chemicals that might go in a pool. We're talking about just regular bleach that you can buy in the store. Um, this is a relatively weak solution that's not going to harm your scuba equipment if you soak it for one minute. The thing that a lot of people don't like about using bleach is that it leaves behind a smell. And this is actually relatively easy to get rid of just by following the regular directions for cleaning scuba equipment. If you rinse it thoroughly in water and allow it to dry before use, the rest of that sodium hypochlorite is going to break down. And when you come back the next day and your scuba equipment's dry, the smell is going to be gone. 
Obviously, the EPA's registra registration system is specific to the United States. However, other countries have similar registration systems. Additionally, you can find products that are registered in, with the US EPA in other countries. So if you think you might, you know, if you look at the label on, on your bottle of product and you see an EPA registration number, you can always look it up. If you're having trouble finding something or you're not sure if the product that you have will kill a certain pathogen or you're not sure if it's safe to use on scuba equipment, you can always contact us, the risk mitigation department here, and we're completely happy to help you out with that. And our email, it will be at the end of this presentation, but it's riskmitigation at dan.org. Since we are divers, it's pretty important to be stewards of the environment and be conscious of what we're putting back into the water. Some active ingredients that are found in disinfectants are actually harmful to the environment. During COVID, Green Seal put out their guidelines for safer COVID-19 cleaning and disinfection. Obviously, this is specific to COVID. However, the guidance can be applied to every day. They have um, three recommended ingredients that can be used on scuba. The rest may, might be a little iffy, such as alcohol, which is gonna dry out some of those components. Um, and an additional ingredient that can be used that's not on Green Seal's list is thymol, which is actually an extract from thyme oil. And it is in quite a few disinfectants that are, are um, registered with the EPA to use against COVID and, and of course other pathogens. If you're looking for a disinfectant that you can just dump overboard or dump onto the ground, I'm gonna tell you right now that that's probably not gonna be possible. Res disposing of these disinfectant solutions responsible responsibly is really critical. You have to remember that these are made to kill microorganisms. And whether you put that, that solution on scuba equipment or in the ocean, it's probably gonna keep on killing microorganisms until something happens, it gets diluted or it breaks down. So if you're unsure about disposal instructions for your specific product, check the product's SDS for instructions. I have here a screenshot of another random product's SDS. And you can see at the top that it has some environmental toxicity considerations, and it also has disposal instructions. So make sure you look up your local registration, uh, your local laws and regulations around disposal. And if you're unsure, um, we can obviously help you out with that, again, at riskmitigation.dan.org. Um, and you know, make sure that we're really taking care of the ocean because if the ocean, you know, wasn't this really great environment to go diving in, then you know, what would we do for a hobby or a living? This brings us to infection control. Now, infection control for your business um, requires you to think critically and creatively about how diseases can be transmitted in your business. And you can ask yourself some of these questions, such as, is there sewage runoff near any of the dive sites I frequent? Sewage runoff can carry pathogens. And are my business practices putting customers at risk? Now, you might think, well, so what if my rinse water or my mask bucket is dirty? But there is some evidence to suggest that diseases can be transmitted in this water. So here I have three different studies that were conducted on rinse tanks. The first study um, was a study of bacteria in communal rinse tanks and samples were collected over four days at multiple times during the day. This study only wanted to see whether bacteria were present and they were, but they didn't make any effort to identify them, see where they came from or whether they'd be path pathogenic, only that they were present in the water. The second one compared two rinse tanks for general equipment and over five days, the first tank was pre-cleaned with breach, bleach before it was filled and the second one was not. Samples were taken at 8 a.m., 1 p.m. and 5 p.m. In both of the rinse tanks, no bacteria was present in the 8 a.m. samples after they were filled, but at one in five, all of the tanks had bacteria in them, whether they were pre-cleaned with bleach or not. Um, there were also mask rinse tanks that were only available when the boats came back because this study did occur at a dive shop and they could only be tested after the fact, but they were also positive for bacteria. Um, again, they did not identify the bacteria, only sought to see if it was even there. The third study sought to identify the bacteria that was in these rinse tanks. Um, the water was collected from the hose that was used to fill these tanks, the tank itself, mask buckets, um, dive sites at various depths, um, the, the shore near the facility, 
And when they actually looked at the bacteria, they found that some originated from the ocean, but some was from divers. None of these pathogens were were overtly pathogenic to humans, but some of them were opportunistic, which means that they would um, infect people who were immunocompromised or if you had an open wound. Um, they were also bacteria that were just generally associated with unsanitary conditions and other pathogenic bacteria might be associated with the bacteria that were associated with these types of condition. Um, Additionally, two species of bacteria were found that are normally found in the human gastrointestinal tract and are not found in open water. Um, one aspect of the study that's important to know is that they did not look for viruses or fungi, only for bacteria. The next interesting study is about conjunctivitis in a group of divers. So 29 people from the USA went diving in Fiji and they were on two boats. Two of these divers just happened to be physicians. So their equipment was stored in communal containers and masks were rinsed every night by staff. Within six days, half of the group was diagnosed with conjunctivitis, which is pink eye. Um, there was also an outbreak among the local population separate to these two boats, but it was at the same time. And it was found that the Fijian resident who was the dive master had an eye infection before going on these boats and was rinsing his mask in the communal bucket. It ended up that 14 out of 30 of these divers, which is almost half, were, be, were symptomatic and two were symptomatic after returning to the United States. So no one on the boat with this dive master, I'm sorry, no one on the second boat got conjunctivitis without going on the first boat with the infected dive master and rinsing their mask in the same rinse bucket that the dive master had used. They deduced that masks were most likely the origin or the, the vector of this disease because they're, they come so close to your eyes. Now this here is an illustration that I took from the study showing the progression of the conjunctivitis diagnosis between the divers. So you can see these, um, let me just find my mouse really quickly. You can see these um, kind of arrows that show people going from the first boat, the star is the dive master, and then go, going from the second boat to the infected boat and vice versa. And you can see the, the progression over the six days of more and more people becoming diagnosed with conjunctivitis after switching around boats and obviously rinsing their masks in this rinse tank. Another very interesting study was conducted in 1999. So it's a little bit old, but it's still very much relevant. So researchers had found an increased incidence of an antibody to a certain um, disease called Legionnaire's disease in elderly divers. And they wanted to see if scuba equipment was the origin of this disease. Spoiler alert, they didn't find any. And that's not really the part that's applicable to this, con this talk. It's more the other results that they found. So what they did was they took um, just recreational scuba equipment and then semi-closed and closed circuit rebreathers that were cleaned in fresh water and allowed to dry before for 24 hours. After that, they swabbed the mouthpiece and then grew the cultures that grew the bacteria that they found on the mouthpieces. Um, multiple species of bacteria, some that are pathogenic to humans, including the strep and staph bacteria and E. coli that we've probably heard about were found. Um, the authors also hypothesize that the increased partial pressure of oxygen at depth during diving and the rough surfaces of equipment can actually cause these bacteria to grow better, which I thought was very interesting. Um, another interesting point that they made was that the nasopharynx, which is kind of where your nose meets your throat, has some natural defense mechanisms. But since the bacteria were on the mouthpieces and those are going inside your mouth, they were able to bypass these natural defense mechanisms, making infection more likely. And they used the example of ventilators in hospitals that have caused lower respiratory tract infections, which is actually prevented in a hospital setting by using a little filter that they put between the respirator and the patient. Obviously, scuba does not have these. Um, a third really interesting observation that they made was Key West scuba divers disease, which is where um, some US Navy divers in Key West had some certain bacteria grow on the diaphragms of their regulators, and it caused respiratory infections. 
And they think that hyperbaric conditions while diving might have allowed the bacteria to more easily infect the divers. So the takeaway here is really that it could be possible for rinse tanks to carry these microorganisms that are pathogenic to humans. So how do we remedy the situation? I've told you all of this stuff about how these conditions could possibly be unsanitary, possibly cause disease. Well, what do I do? It's really simple. You just have to disinfect. So you might choose to disinfect your equipment and then put it in a rinse tank. You might choose to rinse it and then disinfect afterwards. Both of those are fine. It really just depends on what works best for you. But the point is that you disinfect your equipment, especially the stuff that is going to touch your eyes, nose, and mouth, and then you make sure it stays clean. So you don't disinfect and then put it back into the dirty rinse water. But this is actually a very simple solution. And if you get a good product and you follow the directions and it's okay to use on scuba equipment, um, this is gonna be a really, really great solution to the issue that we've been seeing about the possibility of contaminated rinse water. Now, with COVID, we're in a really unique position because we're starting to realize that maybe our practices of just rinsing all of our scuba equipment in fresh water might not be adequate in the future. So it's very important to kind of think of these infection control and disinfection policies moving forward and make sure that they're being followed, that your staff is trained how to do them correctly, because there's no point in putting these policies and procedures in place if they're not gonna be followed. So we've asked ourselves some questions about our dive operation. Now it's time to ask ourselves some questions about our customers. So are my customers at risk for infection? Are there infectious diseases in my area? And are they resistant to medications? If any of the answers here are yes, there's really no harm in providing your customers with information about prophylactic measures or other requirements for their health that they may need when, um, when traveling. So an example here is malaria. Obviously, if your customer wants to have prophylactic medication to prevent malaria or possibly prevent malaria, they're gonna need to see a doctor. But if you're giving them the information maybe about which drugs are, are not working in your area or which ones are incompatible with diving, that's okay, you can do that. Um, there might also be vaccination requirements. In some cases, there might not be a vaccine for whatever pathogen is in your area. So I have a, a chart here of common diseases that would affect divers. Um, they're the typical areas that they're found and prevention and treatment. And you can see that some of them have vaccinations, but some of them are just supportive treatments. So when you, if you contract the disease, all you can do is kind of manage it. Along the same vein of providing information to customers, they should be informed about which steps to take when traveling to your area, including proof of vaccination if this is necessary. They can also um, consult with their country's national health agency, and you can inform the customers of your local health infrastructure, especially if emergency care is not nearby. So here we have um, just a little PSA that Dan has our risk assessment guide, which is a free download. And the, um, the link, whoops, the link is right here, apps.dan.org slash publication dash library. It's a free download. You just put in your name and your email so that we could contact you if there's an update and it'll download right to your computer. There's tons of safety related assessments in here, considerations for boat diving, diving that doesn't include a boat, different rooms in your dive shop, such as your retail space, your, your servicing room, your rental room, transportation, all of this stuff. So it's a really great resource, especially if you're thinking about maybe thinking about um, safety related concerns or upgrades that you could make in your business. And of course, thank you so much to our Dan members, Pro and Business for, for really making all of this possible. Um, and with that, we can go ahead and open it up to questions. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, and thanks for everyone who uh, submitted questions in the chat. I will start pitching those to you. Okay, here's one. Um, in consideration of buddy breathing or donating a primary regulator uh, or with a long hose or an air two setup, have there been any studies on survivability in the water? I assume we're talking about survivability of SARS-CoV-2. 
Yeah, you know, that's actually been a really um, common question that we've been getting during the pandemic. And unfortunately, we haven't run across anything that studies this. Um, you know, some people hypothesize, and this is just kind of a common sense more than an actual research hypothesis that, oh, since it's in the water, some of that stuff will float off, but we, we don't know that for sure. Um, so in terms of training, we can't really make recommendations for, for ways to modify your training or training standards in order to um, not be sharing the same regulator. You'll have to reach out to your training agency for that. Um, but in personal you know, diving, if there's another way that you could go about it, you might think about that. This being said, if it's a life or death situation, obviously, donate your primary, you know, like you would rather get COVID probably than die, but you know, that's just my personal opinion. Um, but again, the answer I guess is is no, unfortunately, we are not aware of any survivability in the water studies, um, especially with, with regards to COVID. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Chloe. Uh, next question uh, from Randy, does steramine work on the COVID virus? So steramine, this actually goes back to a really great point, thank you, Brian, that we were talking about earlier. Steramine is a sanitizer and not a disinfectant. Therefore, it's ineligible to be on list N. Um, additionally, in its EPA registration, it only kind of says it's safe to use in food service settings. It doesn't really talk about anything outside of a restaurant kitchen. Um, so respirators are not on there and scuba equipment certainly is not on there. So no, it's probably not the best thing for you to be using on your scuba equipment. Cool. Uh, thanks for that. Next question. Uh, what is the recommended rinse time? Uh, we're talking one minute, 10 minutes for the household bleach rinse tub or rinse tank. Um, there, there's only a recommended contact time. There's no recommended rinse time. Um, just really thoroughly. Um, if you feel that you've rinsed it very thoroughly, that's probably fine. Swishing it around in the wa water for a minute is, is probably going to be just fine. If you'd like to do it longer, then go ahead. The key here is just making sure that you allow the equipment to dry afterwards. Mm -hmm. And about, you mentioned contact time. Uh, can you speak a little more about yes. that? So contact time is the term for the kind of dwell time that the any disinfectant solution has to sit on whatever you're trying to disinfect. So if I'm trying to disinfect this table and I have a wipe and it says the contact time is four minutes, that means the surface has to stay wet for four minutes. So when we say the bleach solution contact time is one minute, that actually doesn't mean that you have to keep your regulator in a bucket, your second stage regulator in a bucket soaking in this bleach solution for one minute. You can dunk it and pull it out. And as long as the surface remains wet for one minute, you are um, fulfilling that contact time. Fantastic. All right, uh, question from Laura. Uh, can you speak about disinfection of rental wetsuits? It's very difficult for a dive operation to have them completely dry after disinfection before the next day's customers arrive to use rental equipment. Yeah, that's again, another really common question that we unfortunately don't have an amazing answer to. Um, a lot of this, these questions about disinfection actually are very recent. They, they came with the pandemic and we've been really trying our best to find good answers. Um, what we've found so far is that there are two products that were on list N that we know of that list um, neoprene and wetsuits in their EPA registration. So those would obviously be fine to use on wetsuits. Other than that, soap and water and agitation is probably going to be your best bet. Um, fortunately, you know, wetsuits aren't something that are probably going to be a primary method of, of transferring any kind of diseases because they're not going in your mouth or on your face. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, there's no universal really good um, solution to that. You might contact the manufacturer of your wetsuit if you have, um, you know, if you're looking for, for procedures like that as well. Okay. Um, next question from Hannah, as far as disinfection of regulators, is full submersion always better or is spraying down okay? And, and she's referring specifically to the inside of the regulator. Yeah, if you think that you can get your regulator really well disinfected with a spray, that's fine. Um, I think that immersion is probably better because it will more easily get into all of those nooks and crannies inside of a regulator. Um, and again, um, I think it's it's worth worth noting that you don't have to keep them soaking for a minute or whatever the contact time for your product is 
in a bucket or a tub or whatever, you can dip them and take them out. And as long as they remain wet for that contact time before rinsing, then um, you're, you're, you're fulfilling that requirement. Great. Um, how about Dettol, D-E-T-T-O-L for cleaning dive equipment? Yeah, um, you know, we have actually gotten that question before. Dettol is not sold in the United States, so it is not registered with the EPA. I believe on the Dettol website, they have some statements about COVID, um, whether whether the, the, the product can is effective against COVID or not. However, the jury is still out about using Dettol on scuba equipment. Gotcha. Um, and how about the, uh, the the rays of the sun? What are your thoughts on uh, the sun drying um, and disinfection after rinsing? Yeah, you know, I mean, if you want to leave your equipment out in the sun after disinfecting and after rinsing, that's probably fine. Um, I just don't think that there's any guarantee that the sun's rays can get your equipment hot enough to kill any pathogens that might be living on it. So using something that's proven to work is probably a, a better way to go about it. Um, sure. That being said, if it's your personal equipment, nobody's using it except for you, the sun is probably okay because there hasn't really been any other opportunities for, for someone else's germs to get on them, unless of course you've been using a communal rinse tank. Sure. Yeah, and I guess the, another issue with that is the potential for places, nooks and crannies, like you said earlier, places where the sun might reach. Exactly. So you got to consider that. And exactly. then, of course, you got to consider, um, you know, the fact that UV rays is often not great for dive equipment. So your yes, that's your, the life the life of your equipment may be affected by that as well. That's a very um, good point. All right, cool. Um, so it looks like we've gotten to the end of our questions. So I will uh, close this out. Thank you again, Chloe. Yeah, Thank so you for, if you yeah, guys have any, sorry, if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at riskmitigation at dan.org if you need help researching products or have any other further questions about this presentation or dive safety related um, questions in general, we will get back to you at riskmitigation at dan.org. All right, and thank you to all of you who attended. Again, um, special thanks to our Dan members, um, but we're, we're just excited to be here at, at DEMA 2020 with everyone. And uh, we'll hope you, we hope you will join us again in 20 minutes. Uh, so coming up at three o'clock today, we have Stacking the Deck in Your Favor uh, by Dan Medic, Lana Sorrell, and we hope to see you then. Thanks everyone. Four days, nine safety experts, 13 presentations, one simple mission, to make diving safer. This is Dan at DEMA 2020. Safety seminars from the pros who know.